$7 billion in uh, American Rescue <coughs> Plan money from the federal government. And we're here to talk to you about how we hope that we can deploy this money, much of this money, into your region. We're actually trying to get it throughout the state, but we want to make sure that everybody has an equal opportunity to access that money and try to um, make strategic investments in your region to help really set you on a on course to be very successful as we climb our way out of this pandemic that I don't want to take a walk down memory lane on. But um, we will, uh, I'm going to, in a second, I want to hand it over to Erica, but um, after Erica has a, a few minutes to say a few words, we will, I'll hand this over to the folks sitting at the table. Uh, they'll all tell you a little bit about the programs that, that they have to offer within their departments or agencies. Some of it is specific um, ARPA money, but other areas are, are funds that might uh, grade well with that money, or other monies that they think that folks in the room might want to hear about. And really, once we get through that, we want to kind of, we're going to hurry through that a little bit, because ultimately, our goal is to hear from you we want to hear what you're all thinking about. We want to make sure that we're addressing barriers that you may be feeling in your community, that accessing the money. We want to hear about projects that you're thinking about doing um, and give you an opportunity. Um, again, we're here to, to serve your needs, and we're really happy to be in Rochester. We're happy to be in uh, Windsor, Northern Windsor County <laughs> um, this afternoon. We started the morning um, in Springfield. So it's, again, a beautiful day to be here. But Erica, I want to thank you for being a great partner. I'm only going to say a few words because the big draw today is our these folks, and it's a great opportunity to have some face time with people you might not normally get a chance to have face time with. I'm Erica Hoffman Keese. I'm the executive director of Green Mountain Economic Development Corporation. We're the regional development corporation that serves this area. Uh, our service area is Orange County and Northern Windsor County. So they were with my southern colleague, Bob Flint, in Springfield this morning at Springfield Regional Development Corporation. And um, I very nicely asked if they could add a northern Windsor trip, a stop to their trip. Uh, they're supposed to be in Randolph in January, and we got snowed out. So I think that the sun is, is blessing Rochester today with this beautiful weather. After today, if you don't have all the information that you want after you walk out of the session, one of the things that regional development corporations do is act as a conduit and a liaison to get access. So we aren't here. You don't have to come to us. You feel free to come to any of these people directly. But if you've lost a number or a name or just have a question about who you should be talking to, our office is um, there to serve you in that purpose, in that role. So great. Thank you. Um, so a few things before I hand it over.
information that might help as far as different programs that might break well with some of the other, other uh, programs down the line or something that might come in the future as far as IIJA. I have a summary called that we, uh, um, uh, you know, that we've traditionally called Show Me the Money. And this is the uh, uh, summary of all of the state projects or state programs to uh, help fund some transportation projects, water quality project, projects, bike and pet pro projects, which um, I'll call your attention to because that just opened up as far as the uh, bike and pet. Um, there's several different ways that you can, uh, that you can apply for that through either scoping or design construction. There's also small projects. I also have a summary of a number of federal projects that would um, that are already in existence that would uh, that come up with some of this. And um, one one that I thought might be of interest is this uh, fairly, fairly potentially large uh, planning and capital grant that could help with uh, preparing for um, for some of the IIJA, um, you know, getting some of your ducks in a row, things like that. Um, and one of the things that my program does, if you're not familiar with Vermont Local Roads, we focus on municipalities and uh, as far as any, anything that has to do with roadway networks. One of the ways that we've been encouraged to try to help uh, support you guys with all of this federal funds coming is to uh, build and train programs that might help you with uh, grant writing and, um, and things like that. So that is exactly what we're doing. We just recently rolled out a basic grant writing program the next one that we'll have is some of the uh, anticipated pitfalls that you might experience or might trip over um, as far as filling out some of the IIJA um, uh, federal competitive grants. And so we're trying to get out ahead of that and, and, and prepare you guys for that while you sharpen your pencils. Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Josh Hanford, Commissioner of Mont Department Housing and Green Development. I see a lot of friends in the room. I lived in Rochester for 14 years, so know the area fairly well. Um, Alex uh, Farrell, Deputy Commissioner of Housing and Development, we're both here to, um, one, tell you about a few programs, but two, listen to what is going on, what your needs are, um, where you're running into any roadblocks, because I'm sure you've heard there's a challenge with housing in Vermont right now, and I think other places, but um, there's not enough of it, and what we have is affordable enough for the folks living here. So um, this has been a, a struggle sort of decades in the making, really, but we do have a number of new funding sources and new programs to, to try to help provide some incentive for communities and some funding for builders and developers. Um, I'm going to just mention a couple uh, of the programs, some, some of the lower barrier ones that are easier to access sort of on the, the smaller scale, one apartment, one house sort of scale. And one of the larger ones has been the Vermont Housing Improvement Program. It's been around just a couple years and it's a um, up to $50,000 grant per unit. It's a unit <laughs> back online uh, and serving uh, affordable housing, you know, rent renting at affordable rates. It can be to build an accessory dwelling unit, an ADU, where you're adding on a separate apartment onto a, an existing uh, single family home. It can be adding an apartment, uh, it can be renovating a property, it doesn't have to be housing in the past, but converting it to housing. You know, something that's in existence that you need some repair money to bring it up to code, you know, weatherize it, and, and that's a fifty up to $50,000 grant with a 20% match for the property owner per unit with uh, conditions to serve folks uh, in need of affordable housing. And that program is, I think we're already up to about 550 units that have been created with that program statewide. It's access through the regional uh, housing groups, the homeownership centers. Um, so this region kind of touches a number of them, but you're in Windsor County, so it's the Wyndham Windsor Housing Trust is the entity that serves the two counties. <coughs> they are the ones that directly work with the property owners and landlords to help them through the process, help them meet the conditions. And a good thing about this program is there's ongoing funding, there's rolling commissions, there's no due date. It, it, it's sort of apply um, if you think uh, you have an opportunity to provide more housing in your community. Another one is um, brand new. It's Manufactured Home Improvement and Repair Program. Uh, MERS is, is the acronym, and it, it provides small grants to folks that live in manufactured housing, so mobile home parks. Um, there's a lot of uh, folks of uh, lower income that are living in homes that are in really tough shape. And th 
this is a grant program up to $15,000. Most of these grants are $5,000 and under to do immediate repairs, you know, fixed windows, leaky roofs, things like that. Uh, you know, repair doors, front, front steps. Um, this program launched in February, and the first good news I heard about it was we were able to approve, uh, there were two elderly uh, households, very low income, that had lost their heat entirely. This program was able to approve the funding to replace their whole heating system within four hours, the same day. Um, so really quick results on this. We have a sheet up here that has all the, the, the links and, and program descriptions that you can take. Um, so those are, are two lower barrier uh, programs uh, that I think folks should be aware of. Under that mobile home improvement program, there's also funding for lot repairs. Some of these mobile home parks have vacant and abandoned homes on them, lots that are in disrepair, there needs to be a foundation put down, or a new electrical brought or, or cleaned up. There's also grants to the park owner to do that, to make these more um, healthy, safe living environments, as well as homeowner grants for the foundations. If you place a new manufactured home on a foundation, it, it's going to age better, it's going to appreciate, it's not going to have the same problems that older mobile homes used to uh, heave and, and, and create problems. The new manufactured housing is energy efficient, it's energy star, and it lower utility bills. So really trying to provide some, some access to uh, folks that, that um, that, that live in that type of housing, need that type of housing, it, it's an affordable way for someone to become a homeowner in Vermont. Um, some of our other programs are, are much larger multifamily, uh, I think 30 units plus sort of properties, and they are with our partners like the uh, Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, or the Vermont Housing Finance Agency, they're listed on here, they have some long-standing programs and then hundreds of millions of dollars added to them with ARPA money to help support new housing development. Much of that housing also dedicated to those exiting homelessness, trying to help folks um, secure permanent safe housing as well as recovery housing, folks going through those struggles. So there's lots of new sources out there. Some of this can be pretty complicated and, and, and daunting. So, um, you know, seek us out, ask questions if you, if you know anyone that is trying to build housing, you think there's opportunities in the town or in the region. Um, the last thing I'll leave you with is really for all this money to be put to best use and to see sort of more housing being built across the state to serve our residents, it really starts a lot with planning. Back to your community, planning for housing growth, you know, adopting zoning and bylaws that are pro-housing growth in the right locations, um, seeking uh, certain designations to allow some of the regulatory <laughs> barriers to be lessened, uh, also incentives into those uh, smart growth areas. So we have designation programs, and, and there's a, a link up here for that, that really help communities plan for the housing that they need, they want. You've got to do some legwork up front to make it more affordable for your home builders, your developers. Because um, right now we're in a situation in Vermont where there's lots of uh, funding to sort of help uh, folks at, at the lowest income levels subsidize housing to be built. And then there's a market rate housing that folks um, that are wealthier can afford and find a house for themselves to have something built. But sort of in that middle, there really is a, a, a broken market right now. Of, it costs more to build a home that should sell for $300,000. Um, you can't build it for that. It's going to cost four or $500,000, but really, the population needs homes that are more of the $300,000 range, and that even seems high from when they bought a house in Rochester 15 years ago. Um, but that 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 workforce, middle income, missing in, missing uh, income, missing middle income sort of bracket that, that is really above the affordable where the <coughs> programs to support affordable housing end, and where people can't yet compete in the market because the market is so overpriced because there's such a scarcity of housing, so it's driven up costs. So there's some new programs, hopefully we'll get passed in this year's budget um, to incentivize that type of building as well. Um, so please reach out to Alex or I will be here, talk to you about housing, talk to people about housing all the time, and, and if you're involved or you know someone that's trying to build housing, thank them. Um, we often try to you know, look at developers as, as a bad word in Vermont. I'll tell you, people trying to build housing um, they, they need support and assistance and they need incentives to actually pull it off to serve the population uh, that are in the type of housing our communities need. So, thank you.
I'm Brett Long. I'm the Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Economic Development, and we're actually a sister department with Josh's uh, group underneath Secretary Curley's Agency of uh, Commerce and Community Development. And our job is really to try to improve the lives of Vermonters by listening to, supporting, and advocating for businesses, trying to develop a business community across Vermont. And before we got started, a couple of folks mentioned to me some of the issues that you're confronting here uh, in Rochester. Potentially losing your market, having a high school close, and I probably should start off, and I will start off, by saying a lot of what we do is facilitation. We hear about those kinds of, of issues in small towns across the state. You know, we've seen situations, there was a, a situation fairly recently in the northern part of the state where a group came together and, and bought out a market that was going to be closed and turned it into a call. A heavy lift, a lot of work, somebody's got to spearhead it. I certainly understand those issues. Um, but there are alternatives, and I, I encourage you to reach out to us or Josh's group to see what we can do to help facilitate. We're actually involved in a, in a project right now in southern Vermont where they're trying to reuse uh, an existing uh, high school. That high school has actually been vacant for 10 or 15 years, a long time. So the message there is try to re just reach out if you think that there's something we can do to help um, with the issues that are confronting you. <coughs> We're specifically here today to talk about ARPA federal funding opportunities. And through COVID, our department has, I think it's now four or five different assistance programs that we have um, administered. We've currently got one running right now. It's called the uh, Community Recovery and Reinvestment Program, or CRRP. It's a very large program for us and for the state, it's $40 million. Uh, we have um, awarded about a quarter of the money. We're in the midst of trying to get approval to uh, award another, roughly a quarter of that money. So in the next week or two, we expect to go about half, have about half of the money uh, awarded. But we're still accepting applications. Um, there are four or five, depending on how you count, different tracks for financing in that program. One is trying to support the development of childcare facilities. Another is trying to develop affordable housing and to try to differentiate between what we're doing and what Josh's group does, we're trying to um, reach out to affordable housing developers who don't have access to some of the larger, more well-established sources of financing. So they tend to be smaller projects in more remote locations. Um, so lots of information about the affordable housing track on our um, website. We also have a track to try to support the development of businesses, specifically in qualified census tracts. I don't know if there are any qualified census tracts specifically in Rochester, um, but we can certainly communicate about it. And then there's also a track for developing water and wastewater projects when those projects are tied to affordable housing or a business expansion. So a couple of several different tracks, and what we're trying to do there is focus on things that were most directly impacted by COVID. Childcare was very heavily impacted by COVID. And we have the residual need for people to be able to get childcare to be able to go back to work. So I say it's a $40 million pro uh, project program. And awards can be up to a million dollars or 20% of the project costs. So the idea is we're really trying to find projects where they've been percolating for a while, there's a lot of work been done already, but we can provide the, fund, the funding and the financing to be able to get it over the goal line and get people started on, on the project. The next thing I want to talk about is um, our department acts as essentially the marketing arm of a federal agency called the Northern Borders Regional Commission, NBRC, who also has just kicked off um, their annual program. And this is a program that's available in the four northern tier states of New York, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. In Vermont, it's, across, it's available across the state. In the other states, it's in only in certain counties. And it's a, a program that Senator Leahy has pushed very hard during his tenure. And this year, the amounts have been increased to $11 million. So a substantial program. It's targeted at infrastructure specifically, 
things like transportation infrastructure, basic public infrastructure, telecommunications, um, renewable energy, business and workforce development, healthcare, tourism, recreation, but it's not specifically available to businesses, it's available to nonprofits and municipalities. So a lot of what we see is where a municipality is the applicant for funding to support some kind of a need in those other areas, oftentimes supporting a business expansion or development. Um, I don't know if I need to say a lot more about it than that, except that um, it's a two-step process. It, the first step, it involves submitting a letter of interest that describes the project, gets into only a little bit of detail. Um, those will be evaluated, and then if it's a priority project, um, it'll be, that project will be invited to submit a full application. The other thing I wanted to mention is we administer a number of other programs, but one in particular that's, I think, particularly relevant, especially in talking about the closure of your high school, is a brownfield um, redevelopment or remediation program. We're in Great. Yeah, for the high school specifically? Excellent. Um, but our department can make funds available through the agency in, in connection with the Agency of Natural Resources to try to help clean up, uh, remediate brownfield situations. You know, the reason our department's involved is it's specific to try to foster economic development. That's my program. Thanks. Is it easier to see me if I stand? Yes. yes. In full flat and you can see all your faces. Um, hi, hi. I'm Stephanie Smith. I'm the State Housing Mitigation Officer at Hawaii Emergency Management. And who, who remembers Tropical Storm Ever? <laughs> okay. So my the funding that I manage is probably around reducing future impacts from flooding. So prior to ARPA, that was on the FEMA side, managing FEMA funding. So there's two big programs there that I'll tell you a little bit about. One is the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. That's funding that follows disasters in the state. So following Irene, we had $32 million in our program to, to spend anywhere in the state to reduce future impacts. It doesn't have to be tied to whatever the disaster was. But when we have disaster funding in the state, we get a cut of that to reduce our future risks and to look forward and, and see what we can do to prevent the next one. Uh, we can't prevent the storm, but we can prevent the impacts. Uh, so that's one program. The other big program on the FEMA side that I wanted to mention is the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program. So that's FEMA's annual funding program that's across the country, but there's a specific set aside for each state that we can apply for um, to, to do some of that flood reduction risk, uh, risk reduction. So that's the FEMA side. Um, following Irene, it became really clear that we couldn't in Vermont meet the full need of flood reduction that we do doing all the types of projects that we wanted to do with just that FEMA funding. There's specific requirements that, that don't necessarily equate to the landscape that we have in Vermont. So for, for a few years now, there's been an interest in having a state program. Uh, when ARPA became available, we were able to create that program. So our state program is the Flood Resilient Communities Fund. Um, so we're in the second year of funding for that program. Uh, we have just under $9 million left to spend, and I'm hoping to have most of that allocated by this end of the summer. Um, so trying to move things pretty quickly, but helping with the future risk to, to flooding events. So the types of projects, and I mentioned the three different programs. You guys don't need to know which program makes the most sense. We, I don't expect you to. You don't need to know the various deadlines. Um, but reach out to us. I also, in the back of the room here, have Lisa Kolb uh, and Steve Libby, who are both on my team, and we'd be more than happy to help walk you through, walk you through this from, from the first step to the end. Um, so in terms of the types of projects that we can do across all of the funding, um, we can start at a, at a simple, we don't know what to do, but we know we have a problem scale, so looking at a scoping study. We've done a few village-wide studies where we're looking at what are different areas Restricted, what types of projects are going to have the best impact for reducing your flood risk? So then we can help you prioritize that risk and, and increase it in an efficient way. Um, we can look at specific structures like culverts or bridges, and that might need to be upsized, helping with design um, or funding for those upsizing projects. We can do large floodplain restoration projects. So we've done a few of those across the state that we're removing fill, allowing the river to access its floodplain and flood events so that it's not impacting our communities. Um, and we can do property buyouts. So if there's a property that's 
pretty heavily impacted and or has risk to become pretty heavily impacted, uh, we can purchase those properties and make sure that they stay in great open space and perpetuity. So if the river needs that space, they can access it and not a house in the way to be flooded. Um, and we can do vacant parcel conservation as well. So if it's a site that's developable, but we, you're at the town level, you're recognizing there really shouldn't be anything there because the river accesses that site once in a while, um, we can help you conserve that as well. So those are our programs, but I encourage you to, to reach out and let us know what we can do to help you reduce your flood risk. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kathy Del Nau. I'm a state librarian, and I'm here to tell you about two uh, capital project funding opportunities that the Department of Libraries is going to be administering. The first of them is, is through the U.S. Treasury, and it's specifically ARPA funding. So if you remember, think back to the beginning of the COVID pandemic, do you remember what, if your library closed? Raise your hand if your library closed. Quite a lot of folks here in Vermont um, had libraries closed during the pandemic, um, largely because the facilities were older and they weren't set up really well for social distancing, because here in, in the state we actually saw libraries open and then they had to close again when it got cold and they couldn't have circulating air to meet the requirements from the health department um, or you know the, the local health officials. So we learned that our libraries have some facilities issues that actually prevented them from serving as that center that you all needed in your community. Not just to get books, which you think about a lot with the library, but you also go to the library to use the internet, right? So while some people in the community, you were able to work from home, you were able to go to school from home, your kids could go to school from home, uh, you could go to the doctors from home. Community members who don't have the internet in their homes, or who don't have a device to use the internet in their homes, people who don't yet have high-speed broadband, when they would try to go to a meeting during the pandemic with the library closed, did that work out very well for them? No, <laughs> not at all. So this funding is really geared toward a specific ARPA response, and the U.S. Treasury um, has funding that is really carved out for public libraries and other facilities where people are able to access the internet for the purposes of work, education, and telehealth. So the state of Vermont has applied for to use $16.4 million of those U.S. Treasury funds to support public libraries in our state in ensuring that they have facilities that are really able to continuously provide service to you. Um, so some of the things that might qualify would be if, if a library has a significant issue with the building that would potentially prevent it from opening. So we envision that this could be something like an HVAC replacement, that it could be an ADA access issue where some people actually still, can, just on a normal day, forget about COVID, but they really can't get into the building because there may be steps and they need a ramp. Um, it could be something where there's a gaping hole in your roof. And sadly, we do get the Department of Libraries here about libraries in the state that have a hole in the roof or a hole in the floor or a staircase that's not working. So we've, we're still waiting for approval from Treasury, and we're still going back and forth about exactly what this program will look like, but those are the types of projects that might qualify for that $16.4 million. You might have heard, we have a lot of libraries in our state. We know of at least 185 of them. I think there are more hiding out there. Um, so we know that the, the need for improvements to these buildings, many of which are over 80 years old, over 100 years old, that there's a significant need for funding that a lot of towns, especially small and rural communities, haven't had the money to set aside locally in their municipality to support their municipal public library or their incorporated public library. It's about half and half. So the department uh, was encouraged by Senator Leahy's office to apply for congressionally directed spending. So we did that and we were really excited in December to find out that we will be receiving $10 million in congressionally directed spending to support public libraries in Vermont. It could be a municipal public library or an incorporated public library. Both are eligible for these funds to, um, to make capital project improvements that are going to help the community to kind of bolster their, their resources to ensure that their library continues to be able to function, that the building, that any repairs that are needed can be done and that the building can be maintained by the community. 
So the department plans, we have a total of $26.4 million that we are going to be administering. Um, it's exciting for us at the Department of Libraries because that's a really great opportunity for libraries. We'd like to distribute the funds throughout the state. Right now, we are conducting something that is called a needs assessment. So if you talk to your local library and they know that they have an extension until the end of the day on the 15th to submit their needs assessment, that survey and the results of it are going to help the department to build out the grant program for both of these upcoming grant opportunities. We'll do one grant application and like our colleagues, <laughs> we don't want you to have to figure out which grant, which grant you qualify for. Let us figure that out. We'll have one grant application that we, we will score and we'll figure out which projects different communities qualify for. And um, these will be competitive grants. We anticipate that there are a lot, there's a lot of need, but we really want to be sure that we um, distribute the funds equitably around the state. And it's really important for us to be serving specifically our small rural communities with that congressionally directed spending money through the HUD through HUD. So um, look for more information soon. The department will be doing webinars and we've got two flyers up here that you can read about each of the different programs. You can also go to the Department of Libraries website. There's a little spotlight image and you can go straight to the Capital Projects page for those two. Thank you. Good afternoon. So I see some faces that I remember. So after 2013, I worked for the Vermont Agency of Transportation we do the Accelerated Fast Forward in Rochester on 73. So, I worked with this community before. You're an amazing community to work with. Oh, my name is Jennifer Fitch. So, um, today I'm the Commissioner of Building and General Services. At, at the time, I was one of the project managers for the Vermont Agency of Transportation. But a great community to work with, and it's great to see some faces that look familiar today. Um, so, the uh, Department of Buildings and General Services primarily serves internal customers, so we're internal to state government, but we have a, two, a couple of external programs. One is all of our information and welcome centers. We manage all of those. In addition to that, we have an energy office, and in the last couple of years, we've been trying really hard to take our internal program and make it external for municipalities. So basically, we started this program in 2012, 2013. The goal of the program is to make state buildings more energy efficient. And by doing that, we're also reducing our operational costs while reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So it's really a win-win. And we're really excited. Last year, um, we were selected for a $45 million program to make municipal buildings more energy efficient and resilient. So this program is just for you, which is pretty awesome. So how many people here today represent a municipality? Okay, we got a couple of hands. And then there was one person, but how many people here today are from a regional planning commission? Okay, so all eyes on this gentleman over here, and afterwards, all race to him. Um, so uh, this program basically has four components, and so uh, the first component is the regional planning commissions are receiving $2.4 million to help expand capacity and provide direct services to all of their municipal towns. What that means is they have been hired basically to do training, outreach, help with grant application assistance, and also technical assistance. So really their job is to walk you through this program. So if you think about it, BGS group oversees the whole program, then the RPCs are helping administer the program, and then they're working directly with the town. So it's kind of the triangle that we've set up. Um, and so those grants have already gone out, and so the next step, which we're in now, also very exciting, is we have up to $4,000 mini grants. They're very easy to apply for, the barrier is really, really low, and what those $4,000 grants are for is to either build an energy um, committee within your town, or maybe have gatherings within your town to talk more about energy efficiency and resilience and what that means to you in terms of town operations or even your own home. Um, or it may be also used for planning, so you can hire a consultant to come and help identify candidate buildings for you, um, help you start filling out applications, and then there's some other things that we're going to be doing within buildings as well that they can help administer. So um, that opened up about a month ago. We're accepting applications on a rolling basis. Again, the barrier is super low for those, and there's no match requirements, so really easy to get those money. The next step, and this one's really important if you want to leverage the funding that's coming, is building assessments. So um, the goal here is that every community has to do a building assessment on a, on a building that they may want to actually invest dollars into. So they're called level one or level two assessments. <laughs> level one is like a walk around assessment. So that means someone's gonna come, we have consultants that are working for BGS, 
We're going to deploy them through the RPCs um, so we can deploy them efficiently. And they're going to come around. The level one is a walk around. So they literally walk around your building. They look at your windows. I noticed over here on both sides, you have some insulation here. Uh, they're going to look at things like that. They're going to look at what your uh, heating source is. They're going to look at how weatherized your building is. They're going to do those sorts of things when they come around. A level two is the same thing as a level one, but it's more intensive. So they're also going to do a blower door test, which really shows you where your building is leaky, so where it's best to put insulation. Um, and they'll do thermal imaging as well to try to look for those cool spots along the wall, for example. Uh, so it's more, it's more labor intensive, but it gives you more information about your building. So if you have energy bills for the last several years, if you have some building plans, I would definitely um, recommend doing the level two. But again, happy to do the level one, and either one will access you the money. So the fourth step is an up to $500,000 grant to make your buildings more municipally energy efficient and resilient. Again, no match requirements. We're trying to keep those barriers down really low. Again, um, and the goal is we want to help you weatherize, we want to help you fuel switch um, to more renewable heating sources, and really what we also want to do is lower down those greenhouse gas emissions, right? But we also want to make your buildings more efficient, and by doing so, it will be cheaper to heat your building, for example. So your cost to operate your building should go down as a result of this program. So again, it's really a big win-win all around. Um, so the assessment uh, application should be coming out shortly, hopefully in the next four weeks or so. Again, many grants are already out, and we're hoping to do the up to $500,000 implementation grants starting this fall. So we're really excited about that. And I just want to mention, too, that we have a lot of partners. So we mentioned the Regional Planning Commissions. We also have Efficiency Vermont, um, the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. So Katie Buckley, love her. She's amazing. Um, and she's been doing a lot to support our program. And she's going to be putting out some information pretty soon about matching funds. We'll talk about that in a second. And then the last group is the Vermont Energy and Climate Action Network. So again, we have a lot of partners that are helping us get this program off the ground. The last thing that I want to mention that's really important, and thank you to Dep Deputy Secretary Carter, who will be talking here in a little bit. This program actually got selected for revenue replacement. So originally it was ARPA funds, very restrictive in terms of what we could do with it, couldn't meet the intent of the bill. Uh, but it was selected for revenue loss replacement, which means now it acts like state dollars, not federal dollars. And what that does for your community is it allows you to take those dollars and to match them with other federal funding opportunities. So by leveraging this program, you're going to be able to unlock federal dollars. So a great example of that is my partner here at Libraries. So you could take our money and you could take her money and invest it into a library because mine acts like state and hers acts like federal dollars. So lots of opportunities for stacking. We call it stacking. And again, Katie Buckley is going to be putting out um, some information to municipalities about how all that stacking works and those stacking opportunities. But we're really excited to bring this program to you. So hopefully we get some folks that are have had interest so far. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. That's great. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Nancy Tebbets uh, with the Vermont Agency Agriculture, Food and Markets. Um, a couple of things I'd like to talk about. One program that just recently uh, launched is something called the Farm and Food Workers Relief Program. And this is for farm workers. Uh, maybe they were working in produce, maybe they were milking cows, uh, maybe they were in the slaughterhouse. There is a one-time $600 payment that could go to those workers uh, that began at the, uh, the start of the pandemic. If you recall back in the pandemic, a lot of places were not allowed and did not shut down because they were responsible for feeding us and keeping us uh, fed. So that program is available. It's a regional program. It's being run. Uh, there's an uh, application online. It's a pretty simple application. It's run by something called PASA out of uh, Pennsylvania, P-A-S-A. If you Google that, there's an online portal which you can apply there uh, for that one-time $600 payment uh, for uh, those working in agriculture, whether it be produce, milking cows, or in the slaughterhouses. Um, I would encourage people to apply early for that. It's a roll, there's no deadline on enrolling in it, but when the money goes out, the money's done. So the earlier you get your application on that, the better. A couple of other programs to think about, something called Working Lands. Uh, think about uh, someone who earns uh, their living working off the land, whether that's in the woods or on the farm. Uh, we have a granting program. Uh, could be someone that has a, uh, a business where they're turning a wood into a value-added product. 
It could be someone that's got firewood. Uh, they may need some infrastructure improvement with that. Uh, that extend to the uh, farming agriculture community as well. Maybe it's a cheese maker. Uh, maybe it's someone that's working in produce that needs that critical um, storage capacity. Maybe they need a freezer. Um, that is a granting program that we run through the Agency of Agriculture. Another one specific just to dairy, something called the uh, Northeast Dairy Business Innovation Center. Uh, we received some USDA funds, and, and this is thinking about um, some new approaches uh, and also building uh, some of the infrastructure that we already have in Vermont that improves that infrastructure. So think of cheesemakers, uh, thinking that maybe someone that maybe uh, wants to transition to another practice on the farm. Uh, maybe they want to implement more grazing practices. Maybe they want to improve uh, what's in the milk house. Uh, we have grants for that. But also on the processing side, if someone is uh, a cheesemaker and they want to improve uh, their capacity there, that program is, is run through the Vermont Agency of Agriculture. Those are a couple of programs. We're also trying to get a few more things to the legislature that would help the infrastructure for agriculture because we're all aimed at trying to feed more of us locally because of the pandemic. We realized that the system kind of broke down. It was a, natural, a national system. We need more of a regional approach to what we do, but we really need to get more of our capacity uh, with infrastructure, storage, distribution, uh, freezers, all of that, because we can grow and produce a tremendous amount of food in Vermont, but we need that network. So we're trying to get a few programs through uh, the legislature that would focus on uh, three areas particularly. One is meat, uh, one is maple, and one is produce. Those areas that have been uh, historically maybe underserved or have not received programs <coughs> in the past. So we're trying to get a, a program, a granting program through their legislature. And the only reason we're able to do that is because of the pandemic. Uh, the programs, uh, we've got some more robust funding that's come through and we think that as our, as our theme has always been long-term projects that are going to help us uh, down the road in those areas with agriculture uh, to feed more of us here, but also New Hampshire, Connecticut, New York, and the East. Um, around for any questions after this and I think we'll go to Julie now, right? We always close out with Doug. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, good afternoon. I'm Julie Moore. I'm the Secretary of Natural Resources and was going to talk about a few opportunities related to water infrastructure funding that's currently available through the agency, as well as some um, additional opportunities beyond what Commissioner Fitch described related to climate action. Uh, so the Agency of Natural Resources has received uh, nearly $300 million to, of ARPA funding to invest in water infrastructure projects. Uh, there are a number of different initiatives. I'm going to touch on three that I feel like are probably most germane to, to this part of the state. Uh, two of them fall under what we call our Healthy Homes Program. Uh, the first provides direct uh, beneficiary payments to low-income Vermonters who have failed or failing wells and septic systems to replace those systems. Uh, it's got a sliding scale of payment up to the full cost of replacement for Vermonters making less than 80% of median household income. Uh, we have had two rounds of applications so far and received more than 2,000 applications from Vermonters with failed or failing systems. We anticipate running another round towards the end of this calendar year. Uh, individuals have to apply, and so anything you can do to get word out to your neighbors um, that this program exists and encourage them to enroll if they are find themselves in that condition would be great. A related program under that Healthy Homes banner is focused on manufactured housing communities and have been providing grants to work on drinking water systems, wastewater systems, and drainage systems in MHCs. Uh, we know that generally the infrastructure in these communities can be challenging and that oftentimes um, investing in the infrastructure results in a rate increase that residents can't really afford. The beauty of these ARPA funds is we're able to provide a higher level of, of loan forgiveness or cost share than we've ever been able to provide with the traditional programs administered by the Agency of Natural Resources. Uh, we've done an initial round of funding received applications from 56 MHCs statewide, including six in Windsor County. Um, and the, a lot of the initial work is doing assessments of the condition of the infrastructure. Uh, we anticipate another funding round uh, this summer where we will actually put out more money for implementation to help support the construction of those drinking water, wastewater, and stormwater improvement projects. 
So again, if, if you um, are aware of, of manufactured housing communities in your municipality, I um, encourage you to pick up one of these handouts. Uh, we have an email list for each of the different program initiatives, and if folks sign up, they'll get pinged every time there is a, a new funding opportunity. The third funding opportunity I wanted to flag is what we're calling our pre-treatment initiative. Uh, as a wastewater engineer, this is one that brings particular joy to my heart. <laughs> but um, what it is, is oftentimes, particularly breweries, distilleries, um, meat processing, dairy processing manufacturers produce a really high strength wastewater. It has a lot of sort of spent product in it, um, which is challenging for municipal wastewater facilities or on-site septic systems to be able to handle effectively. The pre-treatment program provides grants to those businesses to actually install the necessary practices to knock down the strength of that wastewater. Uh, our hope is that helps these businesses grow in place, and as Anson had indicated in his remarks, we know that some of those um, producers were particularly hard hit by the pandemic, so it's sort of a, a double win. Uh, we've done an initial round of grants. Um, most of them went to breweries, and we anticipate announcing additional pre-treatment program funding uh, later this summer. So again, if you're aware of a local business that you think might be interested in this program, please have them uh, sign up for our listserv. In addition to the water infrastructure investments, uh, the state of Vermont's investing about $250 million of its ARPA funds in climate action initiatives. The biggest chunk of that is going into weatherization programs. Uh, for low-income Vermonters, those programs are being administered through the Office of Economic Opportunity at the Department of Children and Families as part of our low-income weatherization assistance program. But for um, moderate-income Vermonters, there are expanded opportunities through Efficiency Vermont. Um, so it's a great time if, you're, if you know of people considering weatherization projects to look at those two different funders and see if there might be uh, funding available to support uh, a weatherization project. Uh, coupled with that is money to help do electric service panel upgrades. Uh, we know that many of Vermont's older homes aren't ready uh, to plug in an electric vehicle or to support a heat pump. Um, that you need to often go from 100 amp service to 200 amp service and there are grants available right now uh, through the Department of Public Service. Commissioner Tierney isn't able to be here this afternoon but to help support homeowners in making those upgrades to their electrical service. Um, so that's just a, a little, or a high level overview and would only end before I kick it over to Doug with a plug for the fact that in addition to these federal ARPA funds, the Agency of Natural Resources is slated to receive an additional uh, about $350 million in water infrastructure funding. Um, this is as much money as my agency has seen well, over the next five years, as we saw in the previous 50. So it's really unprecedented, the level of funding we have available for drinking water um, and wastewater projects. Uh, if you have a community that needs to make an investment in their system, the time is now. I know that the League of Cities and Towns, Katie Buckley, has done a lot of work encouraging communities to look at their ARPA funds as an opportunity to match some of these state dollars and just want to let you know that there really is an unprecedented amount of funding available to support that foundational infrastructure. I'll turn it over to you, Jeff. Thanks, Julie. Um, so Douglas Farnham, Deputy Secretary for the Agency of Administration. Um, and it's kind of fun for me because um, in AOA, we don't usually interact with the public. Most of my job, um, and the job of the Deputy Secretary of the pandemic is focused on budgeting and contracts and grants, and no one wants to talk about that. <laughs> um, so, before I get into my AOA style speech, one, one consequence of, of Commissioner Terry not being able to be here, she didn't get a chance to talk about the broadband investments that have been part of the ARPA deployment. And um, Julie just talked about a lot of money in water. The other area where there's a lot of money is in broadband. And I think um, I, it's not even a zero to 60 you know, type situation, it's more like a zero to 200. So prior to the pandemic, Vermont just didn't have a lot of funds available after assessing all of our other needs to invest a lot in broadband. So a million dollars, two million, those were the types of conversations that were being had pre-pandemic. Right now, um, there is 
essentially $245 million of federal spending that's being deployed by the Vermont Community Broadband Board. And they're doing that through the communication union districts. It covers, I think, somewhere around 220 out of Vermont's um, 246 or 247, I forget what the number just changed to recently, um, towns. But it's like 90% of the towns are in a communication district. There's a, another method for towns that aren't in a communication district. But those CUDs, as they're called, cover most of it. And the money is being distributed through, uh, through that mechanism. It also has a very strong methodology for, for uh, we have good data on which addresses, which areas are underserved from a broadband perspective. So it is going out to the areas that need it the most. And then now there's another federal program where another $100 million is coming down. So I urge everyone to be aware of and to participate and to kind of keep an eye on what is happening with the CUDs, but there is a structure in place. It is moving forward. Over $100 million of that has already been committed to projects, and over $37 million of it has already been spent. Um, but that is going to be a massive change in Vermont in the access to broadband that, that our communities have over the next five years. Most of that money, most of that $245 million of it, needs to be spent by the end of 2026. So in the next three and a half years, there's going to be a pretty dramatic shift in accessibility of broadband. And I think we're just starting to see signs of that in some communities. We're starting to see some of those projects happening. Um, but at this point, none of the projects have actually been finished. So it is really ramping up right now. And I think that access to broadband is an enabler for you know, higher levels of either working, for, working remotely instead of having to drive in every day, you know, um, having more business starting out in, in uh, smaller communities. I do think that broadband is going to to help with the economic development in our region. And then, um, of course, there's at least another 100 million. We haven't heard back from the feds on if we're getting an additional amount above that 100 million. Um, but that will be a little bit longer timeline. And so the next five years are going to be really um, a massive amount of progress in that front. And then combined with the weatherization efforts, the grid uh, modernization efforts, I think uh, public service department certainly has. It's a busy time. So now shifting more into my um, AOA uh, kind of general remarks. When, I, just like Secretary Curley, I have no desire to revisit the pandemic. Um, but for context, Vermont received 1.25 billion of coronavirus relief fund early on in the pandemic. A lot of that and the, and the time frame to spend it was incredibly short. AOA stepped in as a central administrator for that money all the programs were built in all the different departments and agencies, and the agency of administration oversaw the program development, made sure we were within the federal rules, and kind of coordinated the portfolio of spending. The decisions on what to spend on were made by the legislature, but that 1.25 billion, it was spent very well, but it was spent on short-term needs, on helping the healthcare system get through the pandemic, on economic to support to, to reduce the amount of businesses that closed. And I would say, as a former tax economist, if you look at how the Vermont economy has weathered the pandemic, we, we actually made it through the pandemic much better than a lot of other states because we did put resources into helping businesses survive that tough time. We did put, we did spend our money quickly, much more quickly than most other states. So that was reactive money and it was spent very well, it was spent very quickly. Um, 1.15 billion of that 1.25 was spent before the end of 2020. So we were ready to, essentially when it was originally set to expire, we pretty much had that all spent and we had no uses for all of it. The one year extension that helped out a lot of states didn't really change things for us that much. It actually shifted small amounts of funding around for us, but uh, Vermont really got through that and spent that money fast. Then the ARPA state fiscal recovery came that was 1.05 billion of very broad discretionary money and 113 million of capital investment money that had to be tied to broadband. When I talked about that broadband earlier, that's where that 113 million came in. I just, I'm trying to talk about the numbers for the scope here. The 1.05 billion, again, was, uh, it was appropriated by the legislature, worked with the governor on spending it in buckets, really, and I think that recovery money was spent by Vermont as it was intended to be. 
in infrastructure that in economic uh, recovery efforts that really help Vermont get set up to be in a better position if there's a future pandemic. And I think that the heavy investments in the water sector make a lot of sense because the more time I spend in state government, the more I realize that investments in a community's water system are one of the main things that are holding our communities back from growing smartly and from, from more businesses set up, getting set up. I was just talking to a business owner in Chester who was basically saying, well, it's lucky our business is this way because the town was concerned when we came in and didn't know if there would be capacity on the water system if we were doing business in this kind of way. It happened to work out, but that also tells me that Chester is kind of redlined on the capacity in their system. And I think a lot of Vermont communities are in that position where we haven't necessarily had the extra funds to, to upgrade and to prepare capacity for growth. And that's what a lot of these ARPA funds are doing, is trying to set the stage for long-term growth in Vermont, and then allowing the communities to pick their path of, you know, this is how we want to grow. Um, this money we're talking about, the hundreds of millions of dollars, the billions of dollars, we usually fight over between five and $30 million a year in new initiatives in state government. It's that the annual conversation pre-pandemic was down in that range, five to 30 million in most budget years of new stuff. This is really, really uh, a once in a lifetime opportunity for towns. And I do think um, if, you're go if your community is going to grow in the next 20 years, it has to be enabled now, it has to be planned now. Because at the federal level, I don't think that we're going to see this again, not in my professional lifetime. I think, um, the long-term impacts of the level of spending at the federal level that came out, the kind of the political situation at the national level. We're not likely to see more funding coming out, especially with the level of discretion and, and, and um, kind of the flexibility that was provided states was highly unusual as well. So um, the door isn't closed. On ARPA, we, we are right at about half of the money. About 500 million is, is right around there is obligated. And so there is still opportunity to get in there, but then even after the ARPA programs are getting farther along, we have the bipartisan infrastructure law programs, Julie referenced some of those for agency and natural resources. The agency of transportation is also getting a great deal of funding in the bipartisan infrastructure law in more traditional areas, but dramatically increased um, levels of funding, which will provide more opportunity for more towns to participate in those programs. And then the Inflation Reduction Act also was passed, and those programs haven't rolled out yet at the federal level. Inflation Reduction Act programs are strange. They're different. They're not this state model where the state was given money and, and then discretion. They're not the bipartisan infrastructure law where more money was pumped into the existing channels of formula grants and competitive programs that already existed. A lot of new programs, a lot of new um, tax credits, a lot of different vehicles were created in the Inflation Reduction Act. So there's going to be a lot of opportunity in that, in, in that program over the next couple of years. It's going to be become more clear what that is. But it's also going to be, be different, and it's going to be new. So I do think that's one area I would encourage communities to keep an eye out for, especially for communities that are interested in climate change. Because from a policy perspective, climate programs um, were the major component of the Inflation Reduction Act. Even though it's called the Inflation Reduction Act, it's actually I think from a policy perspective, more focused at some of those green programs and promoting um, energy efficiency. So um, very important five years. And then the last thing I would talk about is during the session, the administration proposed $3 million for, of general funds, so of state money, for municipal technical assistance um, that could be prioritized to communities that, that um, based on a number of metrics, um, appear to, are, are much more likely to need technical assistance. Uh, in general, smaller communities are less likely to have the tax base, to have the budget, to fund economic development or our planning staff, right? And that's fine most of the time, right? Um, smaller communities may have long stretches where they don't necessarily need to make any big changes, so keeping someone on staff would not, wouldn't, wouldn't always make sense. So that $3 million is prioritized for those smaller communities. Uh, for instance, 
Um, Rochester is pretty high on that list, just outside the pre-qualified range. But we do, in con consulting with the Regional Planning Commissions, who are going to play a huge role in that program, um, we don't believe the full $3 million is going to be taken up by pre-qualified towns. And starting in May, we're going to have a mechanism for towns to um, come in the door and propose and, and request assistance that aren't pre-qualified. Um, and then we'll assess those as a group. And I think with Rochester being close to the, the uh, pre-qualified level, you know, we would, uh, request for assistance from Rochester would certainly be taken extremely seriously. Um, one thing we're trying to encourage there is, of course, working with Regional Planning Commission, but also <coughs> proposals that set up um, shared staff or shared capabilities with other smaller communities in the area, those are heavily favored, right? Because sometimes it may not make sense for one town to have um, a full-time resource, but if they share, if three or four towns that are smaller share a resource, then they can um, support that resource long-term and it's more affordable. So that program is going to move very fast. Um, the opportunity to start putting in requests will start in May. And we do anticipate that that $3 million should be spoken for um, by the end of the calendar year. Because what we're really trying to do is make sure that smaller communities, communities that need the technical assistance help, have additional support so that they can put in applications to be considered. Um, because we have to have all of the ARPA money obligated by the end of next year. So by 12-31-2024, it has to be obligated. And so we can't take our foot off the gas in our programs. So what we're trying to do is help provide additional support to some communities to make sure that we're at least seeing all the projects. And then um, we have to have spent the money, of course, by the end of 2026. So we're definitely in a move very fast situation, but we do want to get more options in. And one thing I was remiss in forgetting, um, one reason we're out here today talking to you is actually my work with John Zanin over there. Um, he helped us look at projects and try to identify you know, which parts of the state we're not hitting as much. We want to make sure the ARPA money is going out equitably and, and uh, helping to improve everywhere in the state, not just the very geographically dense, densely populated areas. So I think one thing that sp spurred this, this tour, this kind of conversation is um, we want the programs to hit more towns. We want to get more applications. And the only way to do that is to go out and talk to people. So thank you all for coming here today. And uh, sorry for if I took up a bit too much time. We have some question time. No, we're good. We're good to stay here. So thank you. Uh, so with that, uh, this is when we want to turn it over to all of you and hear from you. So is there anybody that would like to volunteer to go first? And um, what I would just ask is if you um, would state your name and you know ask your question so everybody can hear the question and we'll try to fill it out to the right person. There's got to be somebody that's got a burning question. I have a question. So I'm part of the repurposing of the high school project. We've been at this since 2020, February 2020. And we are now uh, starting the, uh, the phase two of the wrap up. And we were able to work with the Vermont Community Development Board to get a feasibility study. And with the balance of that, uh, those plan grants, we're doing other things. We are incredibly grateful for our regional planning um, committee, and we've been greatly supported, uh, especially by Sarah Wright. So, but the, the property uh, is currently owned by the school district, and once we get the results of the environmental assessment process, which we are so for, the town will hold an acquisition vote. Act of 36 basically said the town uh, can acquire for a dollar, but we give voters, of course, want to be so we are working very closely with the school district right now. And one of the questions I have is, is there any kind of funding where in a situation like this where the prospective property owner, which would be the town, depending on that vote, and the current property owner, which is the school district, and I do believe the school district is also considered a municipality, is there any way that we can work in partnership to actually qualify for some of these grants? I mean, so far we've been doing well as the prospective buyer. But for some of these grants, do we have to already own the property? Because I understand that there is a very much deadlines to for when these grants need to be submitted. And so we're in that sort of precarious state where the voters want all the information. We're working with um, kind of a little bit scarce availability of 
some of the uh, consultants that are necessary to move this process. So it's very hard to know a date by which everything is going to be completed. And yet we want to be able to take advantage of this funding because the feasibility study put a pretty high price tag on that. Uh, and we want to do the funding staff, right? Bernie Sanders has supported this before, and he's supporting this right now. But when we pass the Congressional you know, Appropriation Committee, we don't know. So I'm asking the committee, what would we, in this particular situation, be eligible for? So I do believe there are programs that where we encourage partnerships between the municipality and the project, correct? Uh, I don't know if anybody knows really how to tackle that one or wants to start with it. Jennifer, it looks like you might be willing. So, um, so you're in an interesting uh, situation where you're, you're saying the school owes it and the municipality wants to buy it. So the way Act 172 works for the up to $500,000 in our program is it's for municipally owned buildings except for schools. So that's the tricky one. But if the municipality is going to buy it, then it will technically be owned by the municipality. Is it going to be used as a school or is it going to be used as something different? Well, the proposal that is right now is to have a, a repurposed building that would provide community services like child care, adult services, uh, arts and learning center, as well as business rentals. So we have a piece of it that's economic development as well. It's a complex and a large project, but it's, it, it grew out of a community engagement process. So we're trying to meet the unmet needs of the community. So it sounds like the school, the school will have access, but it will not have ownership. Okay, so it sounds to me like if you apply for our program, then the second piece would be when it becomes owned by the municipality, meaning, you know, we'll have applications open at a certain time, and it will be dependent on whether or not it is owned, or if it, if it is likely to be owned, then it's a conversation we can have on a case-by-case -case basis about eligibility and, and when could you be eligible and all those different kinds of things. But it does sound like you could apply for this program. In addition, uh, a project like that probably would qualify for Northern Borders Regional Commission financing. Mm -hmm. for that. Uh, you know, that, that, pro that program is open now, maybe next year, if you're talking about something like that. But we have uh, provided funding to uh, people who are trying to purchase property in the past. And, Brett, correct me, I mean, it seems like there might be some we might be in a phase where we're asking folks to sort of put forth some ideas, which still may be premature in their situation, but she could at least yep. go on our website and get connected, correct? Yeah, and absolutely. And we'd be seeing. happy to talk to you about NDRC financing and Good. Um, the nuts and bolts. And we're, we're trying to, you know, be the strongest uh, application for an implementation grant. We want to upgrade the building to make it energy efficient. Uh, before being occupied by tenants. So there's these steps that we have to go through. And um, we've had great support under uh, Josh's department as well. Fantastic people really help us along. We're right now working with Grace Vincent and uh, Nate Cleveland. And, and so we're moving along. But when we started this process, we were very naive because we're volunteers. And so we really sort of learned about navigating the regulatory landscape, and it's fast. And there's no roadmap. And all these projects are quite different. What, so what's we, the expected cost of doing the work you're thinking about? So the feasibility study, uh, which comes in at a 35% inflationary you know, price tag, is up to 3.1. But there, there's, there's aspects of it that we see could be addressed by other funding sources mm -hmm. uh, so in that funding stack. And we're also hoping that that 35% will actually come down. Right. So. I, I ask because um, virtually every project we see has, as you refer to, a funding step. It's really difficult to uh, put together funding in Vermont. And most projects have a little here, a little there, and a little there in order to be able to get over the finish line. So it sounds like you're heading in the right direction. Thank you. But the site control question is, you know, clearly if you have to own, you can have a long-term lease, you know, something, but the limbo piece, you know, it sounds like MBRC might be unique that it could be set aside for the eventual new owner. Right. Um, a lot of other programs, there has to be a, a site control new ownership or some long-term lease um, in order for the money to actually go into the, the project. But that's 
Yeah, so these are the pieces that we're sort of trying to figure out right now uh, so that we can access funding now. We're hoping to have a book by the end of August, but we just can't know because the process is what the process is. Great. We'll uh, move around. Maybe some other thoughts will come in on to come into play on that. Are there other questions folks might have? Sure. I was leading the energy committee and uh, kind of energy coordinator here in Manchester. Um, we've had the equivalent of a level one in our buildings here. Um, the buildings in greatest need, of course, are the high school, the library, our town office, and our town garage. Put in the town garage on the lower door, and it's quite common. <laughs> Necessary. The um, office, the library, uh, the library has actually had two, uh, at least I think two uh, efforts um, in conjunction with Efficiency Vermont, but actually in its very next door, the structure has started to have some real problems because of water. And uh, we put together a scope of work. Um, we have to do it again. Historic preservation has some other ideas about it. We have to have some discussion between the two of us about building science. But um, are there, you know, what kind of flexibility is it there? I mean, do we, uh, if we are, if the auditor would take a look at the three buildings where a builder door would be more helpful, uh, can they look at that other and, and you know, there's some common sense in that. And then the other question is, are the auditors those who are um, coming through efficient, working with efficiency of the model? Is there another group of auditors? Because availability of those folks is very low right now. So I'll let Jennifer take so that. So our job is to make your job as easy as possible. That's what the goal is. So um, we have hired four different consultants to come in and do these energy assessments. They can do level one or level twos. If you've already had a level one done, you're still going to need to do what we call a gap assessment because there's other things in the bill that need to be assessed that are beyond um, what a level one or a level two would do. So no matter what, we got to come back out. Um, and to that end, you can apply for as many municipal buildings within your town as you'd like to. We do ask, or we will be asking for you to prioritize those because they're spreading <coughs> across the state. So we want to know what's your number one, two, and so on and so forth. Um, we're going to try to hit as many buildings as we can with the $5 million that was appropriated in the bill. So we're going to keep doing those assessments until the money runs out. So it's just a matter of sort of knocking on the door first um, and, and getting in, and then we will work through the RPCs to deploy these consultants. We're doing some other things to make your lives easier too. So ADA is something that's referenced in the bill. We're going ahead and we're putting some uh, consultants on a retainer contract that municipalities can, can basically work to grab those folks to do ADA assessments as well. And uh, talking about historic preservation, we're already having conversations with historic preservation and ACCD about how to get some of these buildings to really, really quickly in that historic assessment. So we're doing lots of things to make people's lives easier. That's the goal. If we find working through the RPCs that there's other resources that towns would really like to have access to, they just need to let us know at BGS and we'll go ahead and put them under contract. But really, we're trying to make it easy, super easy. So the most important thing is to get with um, the RPC and then they're gonna walk you through that whole process. But it is really their job once they connect with you to help you um, complete the applications and then when we send out the consultant to do the assessments, it's gonna be their job to help organize those assessments so they're done efficiently. So if we're coming to Rochester, Let's say we're going to do three buildings. We want to hit those three buildings in the same day, right, to make use of that consultant to the best of our ability. And the RPCs will be helping us schedule and coordinate all of those. I like these years. That's what we're trying to do. So, I did not hear this question asked, but I heard you say that schools were excluded from that is, what you can do. So my right. question would be, if schools needed this done, is there a place for that to happen? So uh, it is a great question. So um, any of the retainer contracts that we have through the Office of Purchasing Contracting, which sits within BGS, those are open to municipalities. So we have lots of different retainer contracts, and people can work off of those. The only difference is, is that you have to pay for it, versus Act 172 is paying to have the assessments done in municipally owned buildings except for schools. So do you know if there's any? Again, I know this hasn't been asked. I'm just curious why yeah. schools were, there must have been a reason they were omitted. 
Yeah, I was going to highlight for, for Commissioner Fitch's program that ownership really matters. Like, some libraries are owned by the municipalities, <laughs> and it has to be a municipally owned building for it to qualify for the BGS program. Um, as far as schools go, one reason they, they weren't included in the Act 172 program is that the, um, I know the acronym is ESSER, but there were multiple tranches of funding that were dedicated to schools throughout the pandemic, and they received a very substantial amount of, of assistance for weatherization and, and HVAC improvements over the course of the pandemic. So that was why, they, why schools were excluded, was because there was, uh, and I think most of those programs have, for the most part, run their course. Some of the work's probably still getting done, um, but those happened um, over the last two to three years pretty constantly. So that's why uh, schools aren't afraid. Okay. But it's written into the bill, meaning um, BGS itself, for example, didn't exclude schools. It was, you know, through the legislative process that language was put in there. Right. Okay. Uh, in the back, I have a question about public transportation. Uh, I wonder if there's any chance that there could be a reasonable public transportation linking our town to other towns and communities. We don't have a pharmacy. There's no way for people to get their uh, prescription drugs unless they leave this area and go somewhere else. And so I'm wondering what can be done. There used to be a stagecoach that ran at relatively normal hours for people to use, but that has been discontinued and we're quite isolated. So I wonder if any of you have any suggestions. There is a uh, program, I'm not familiar with the, all of the details, but there is a pro program called Connecting Rural Communities that might fit for that. But that's something we could, we could talk about, see if we can identify something that would be helpful for you. Um, can I just get your name? I just, get, I, I think for purposes of making sure we can get back to you on that one. Burma, like the country, B-U-R-M-A, Cassidy, C-A-S-S-I-D-Y. Okay. What was the first name? Burma. 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 Burma Cassidy. Okay. Yeah. And I, I'd like to add on that one that um, transportation is another one of those areas where in distributing the ARPA funds, spending in transportation was explicitly prohibited at the time the ARPA passed. And so the legislature worked with the governor over two years. They didn't make a policy decision not to spend any of that billion dollars on transportation. It was prohibited. After all of that money had been appropriated, like in the most recent federal vehicle, they actually allowed states to spend up to 30% on transportation, but all of that money has already been planned out in these different programs. So I think um, it's possible that we could see things change with some transportation spending getting pulled into scope for ARPA over the next year and a half as programs run and we see if everyone's gonna spend all their money or not. But um, I just wanted to highlight that the main reason we're not talking about a lot of transportation programs today, it's not a choice that we made in Vermont, it was a, a federal aspect of the, of the law. I just wanted to clarify, is it Tri-Valley Transit, the service provider for this area that replaced Stagecoach? Yes. And it, it, yes. it just doesn't run frequently enough, because I know it's, it's quite, it goes all the way from Middlebury to Thetford. You know, it's over three valleys. Yeah. Once COVID hit, it just yeah. pretty much shut down. Because my whole phone number was the previous one. <laughs> it, gets, <laughs> it gets confused with the old stagecoach number. In listening to the discussion about the energy work and the consultants, I think that's something we touched on earlier in Springfield and everywhere at the capacity. Whether it's at the federal government moving all this money and then they're not getting back quick enough because they're under resourced and staff, the state 
all of our partners at the regional organizations, the nonprofits, and then all the businesses trying to respond to all this money. I mean, just in our department budget alone, it's up 300% since before the pandemic. So if we weren't sized to deal with this level of uh, influx of money and all the resulting work that's happening before, it, it, it's just, that's reality. We are all, everyone is overstretched and there isn't enough people to do and to respond and everyone's just making the best of it that they can. And, you know, maybe we'll, we'll catch up at some point um, or maybe it'll stretch on and as, as Doug said, help um, mitigate the sort of possible economic downcom, downcom, uh, downturn because we have these resources that are gonna continue to be spent in our communities for the next five years. Which will, which will help in, in some ways if there is some sort of downturn because projects are still happening. Likewise, if we're going to meet our state goals for energy and greenhouse gas emissions, we've got to have more workforce there and more, more training and development in those specific areas. Yep. Absolutely. Other questions? I see a hand over here. So, my name is Lolly. I'm recently new director for Park House, which is um, affordable co-housing for seniors and other adults. 100-year-old building across the corner. <laughs> um, I'm, I guess I'm wondering, so I think about, um, um, for one, our building is old. Um, we did have some recent remodeling, but there are some other energy efficiency things we'd like to do, replacing boiler, some ADA accessibility types of things we'd like to do. Um, and then aside from the building, um, I'd love to figure out a way to help make it more affordable because I think as um, the population ages with the inflation right now and um, sort of a, a stagnantness on um, retirement incomes and um, benefits and things like that. I, I, we struggle to sort of make ends meet in our own budget in order to keep it affordable for them. Um, where do I begin? <laughs> which problems or which, which pot should I like aim for first? Do I try and, um, I don't know if that's even a question for you guys, but the, Hearing about some of the housing initiatives, I'm not even sure if we, you know, we are a nonprofit, but do we qualify? We're not a municipality. There's been some programs I looked at that were geared towards um, uh, affordable housing and whatnot, but they were more, you know, homeowner specific programs. Um, some things I've tried to look into for our residents that um, I'd have to apply for every single one of them myself in order to to help them do that. Um, but we have 15 people um, living in our building that I'd just like to help. Yeah, so clearly the affordable housing programs, I do know that there was an investment probably five or six years ago with the Park House um, uh, to, to try to address some of those things that the main funder in this in this world and, and your, your program would be Vermont Housing Conservation Board, VHCB. Um, there possibly some other uh, through the town through the CDBG program. I think there was a piece of, a, a, an assessment of the needs. It, it kicked off that work that was done about four or five, six years ago. Yes. Um, and, and so, be digging that back, doing, continuing to follow up. I, I know the challenges of of trying to keep things affordable, but yet make repairs and how you're paying for all that um, is tricky. Um, and there's lots of um, senior living facilities that are in a similar boat across the state that um, are in need of uh, significant investments and you, know, you can't really charge more for the services to make those, so you're going to need to rely on these programs to do that. Um, I know the town, you know, I'm pretty sure still votes to support your know, tax abatement or whatever it is, and so I, I'm happy to come and talk to us and can give you the name. That that's your your, your best source. But you're going to need to talk to them, and you're going to talk to them often, and you're going to need to also include your reps, your your legislative reps from this region, to echo your need to um, support that application because there's lots of application and lots of demand for those same resources. But happy to chat with you after. Um, and a follow up, just to because you made me think of it as well. Um, 
obviously, I think it's a nationwide thing, but, um, but all of our population is, is aging, and more and more people are looking for these alternative types of places to live. Um, I think ours is relatively unique in the way that it's set up, but um, if we wanted to expand, if we were, if it was possible for us to do that, I think we could fill some a new place up like really quickly. We um, have a relatively extensive waiting list and I've had one for a couple of years. Um, so the thoughts have been, you know, the wishes and the dreams have been floated about, you know, what if we could um, add another building or, you know, um, add on to our building some way to increase our capacity. Um, does that something, does something like that fall under? Yeah, it's, 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 it, I'd add another acronym there for the <laughs> finance agency. They were looking into some big federal uh, low-income housing tax credits, and there's a, a, a small carve-out for uh, senior and independent living. It, it still is very competitive, but let's chat afterwards and can start that conversation. And not just us, we all do, but we've got uh, a little one-page up here that captures some of these programs and business cards, so we need to get all of us. Yeah. Oh, over here. Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm Larry Pleasant. I'm the Emergency Management Director for Rochester. So, uh, as EMD, one concern that I have is that the valley currently does not have an uh, ambulance uh, in our valley. We have to come over a mountain range to get here. And uh, what keeps me up at night, one of the things is we could lose neighbors because of that, that way. Uh, can, can you folks comment on availability of funds for creation of a ambulance uh, building to have house, house an ambulance in the sleeping facility? Are funds available for it? Is this something that a municipality uh, would attempt to work, work, work with or would it go right through the local land? So much public safety here. <laughs> yeah. That's that's the first query for um, you know I think yeah, I mean the, the emergency services around the state, I think you maybe heard a lot of articles that you, know, you put that in that boat, emergency services, some of the fire departments, some of the sheriffs. I mean there's a regional sort of shortage of capacity that, that's going on. I would park you in some of our rural communities that maybe new approaches or new yeah, new approaches to how we're addressing these needs that many of the small communities have are probably going to so be, that be a novel, a novel yeah. approach. But for example, if we were to one day uh, create a new town hall, yeah. perhaps on the former school, sure, if that were to happen, and perhaps redevelop our current uh, offices for affordable housing, yeah. which would be a good location for it. Uh, could we could potentially build in an ambulance or other um, municipal service garage with that? I mean, I think, again, it's an infrastructure, you know, change that potentially could qualify the fact that it hasn't, you know, sort of the project itself hasn't been, it's not that far out of the gate, so to speak, could be challenging in terms of even <clears throat> getting in under the wire, so to speak. That could be the challenge. That being said, I don't think any of us are here to say like it's completely off the table. Uh, Erica, it looks like you might have a thought on this. Have you spoken to anyone over in um, Sharon or Royalton? Because they are going through a similar situation. They have a rescue service and are trying to kind of re replace where it's located for better accessibility to their service area. And so I think in touch with those folks, they might have some ideas. I've been in touch with uh, Matt Parrish okay. over in Bethel. Okay. And uh, you know, they are they are our provider here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but they're they're covering covering seven towns. Yeah. Like they're in Barnard and yeah. somebody here has a heart attack. You can get tough. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's, there's two wagons on a lot of I was gonna say, Larry, I'll connect with you uh, if you want. I can connect you with uh, Department of Health safety you may potentially have some avenues. I know a lot of these programs on the federal funding side especially are a lot focused on the infrastructure pieces. Well that's but, what that's what our situation we need well, to create the, the, the I mean specifically like your public the other public works infrastructure but there may be some other avenues for especially federal funding for more <laughs> safety stuff. Um, I mean, really, 
they don't see the Communities Act and some other things. So basically, we'll be there. That would be great. With that, I think I'm just going to be respectful of folks' time. So we're at time. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, some of us probably need to run out. There's a few that may linger for a few minutes. I will give you, you one last question. One last question. One last question, absolutely. Right. Um, earlier on, you asked um, how you were doing and next time on the select board and all that. You asked, you're hoping to identify what are some of the barriers that are there that are leading to the problems, and this is specific to housing. Um, I'm curious what, if there's any thought about Airbnbs and how they have impacted the availability of housing in the rural communities like this where it's, it's uh, seen people like to come here and visit and you can't find a house to rent or, or buy because they're being bought up and, and pressed into services, short-term rentals. Yeah, short-term rentals, we could spend a whole day talking about that. <laughs> I mean, you know, there, there's, there's statewide data and then there's regional data and not every community is experiencing the same challenges. Not every community has the same feeling about short-term rentals. Some are welcoming with open arms. Some are saying it's it causing a real problem for, for their community members. So um, there clearly is a change, you know. Um, but what's interesting is Vermont has had second homes for 100 years ago. We've been the second highest rate of second homeowners in the nation, only behind Maine, New Hampshire's third. So there's always been um, a vacation homes that have largely been you know, vacant or used seasonally, and short-term rentals with the online platforms have sort of flipped the switch on a little bit and have allowed people to um, either be owners of those properties easier than they were in the past because they can cover their bills, allow people that have second homes to use them for part of the time. So what we're seeing statewide, I don't know Rochester's data, but about 3% of the housing stock is used to short-term rentals. About half of that is within what are already vacation homes. And 17% of Vermont's housing stock is second homes. So short-term rentals are much smaller problem than second homes if you're looking at homes out of the housing stock. But yet it can have an effect on a community. I, I'd say the other part of this challenge is, is short-term rentals are often now used for um, extended work stays. You know, people are using them for other than just vacation. Sometimes they're serving as traveling nurse or someone that's actually working in your community because they can't find something else. So then that's an added challenge. Um, and then um, I think an another one of our problems is we are a heavily visited state. You know, tourism is the second biggest industry. Are we building enough actual vacation lodging properties to keep up with the demand? If we aren't, they're going, it's being met somewhere else. You know, even in the capital city where we have lots of uh, legislators and lobbyists and folks that come. There was a new hotel that was defeated in downtown uh, Montpelier. Folks didn't want to see the parking garage associated with it. It was defeated. Well, the short-term rentals in Montpelier have just grown. It's, not be it's because no one has taken up that demand other than the, the folks that already own housing there because it's not going away. And so I think it's a multi-part challenge. And we've also used a lot of the lodging properties to serve emergency housing over the last couple of years. Thousands of units out of what was part of the traveling space available is also shifted to be emergency housing. So there's so many things feeding into this that it can absolutely be a huge problem in some towns and not a problem at all in others. Yeah, it does, it's showed us that the lodging properties really are a part of our housing stock and that, you know, short-term rentals has, I think, highlighted that more, made it more clear to us, but I think that just means to take that into account when we're thinking about do we have enough housing stock, that's also part of it. And, and what do we have to do now to meet the needs <coughs> for that whole spectrum of all those types of housing? Especially to bring in the demographic that we need. Mm -hmm. right. Younger working families. That's what's going to sustain this, this uh, state. And <coughs> we can't afford to move here. Yeah, they just don't have housing. But right, the other component that we see in our department is work, what's happening is hotels, et cetera, are being used as workforce housing. Mm -hmm. So ski areas, places like that, are, are purchasing hotels, taking them off the market, creating more Airbnb demand because they, they don't have enough workforce housing. And, and someone that lives in a community like this that may be struggling to pay their bills, they might convert part of their place to be there and need to pay their bills. So it's hard to paint one, you know, pick one problem 
when there's so many other people, sometimes it's a solution as much as it's a problem. There's a difference between someone who lives in communities, invests in the community. Most of our government's volunteer town, town governments, and, and someone who just purchases a building or multiple buildings just for Airbnb. That's a whole different reality. I read a recent article on that. I understand the percentages are kind of indefinite, but still, some towns like Woodstock have actually created policies, and I assume that that is, you know, something that towns can do if they're particularly threatened by this phenomenon, and they can't get their teachers in, and they can't get their healthcare workers a place to live. Towns are unable to, yeah. So a town can make their own policy. Burlington. There's a lot to have, but you have to understand your own data because you could have a you absolutely do. an opposite impact of what you thought you were going to solve. Yeah, it takes research. I yeah, I know. I know. I said one more, but go ahead. I feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> I want to let you speak. It's a quick practical question. Um, my wife and I own a small farm in town. We raised blueberries and raspberries. But we we've had it for 16 years. We thought we'd be living on it by now, but it's a farm. Um, so we, we're still trying to get enough money for that. So I got a quick, I, I, my ears picked up a little bit relative to housing. If we could build on the farm, we'd free up a house in town. I've tried going for working lands, looking working land spreads, but there's been matching funds that have been daunting and other things. Is there some way that, that, that this group could like help clear the way so that we find maybe some money could come from housing, maybe some could come from working lands? But if I get rebuffed by working lands, then I'm going to go back. Is there a way to coordinate to make something work out? I know There might be a little bit of hope. There is uh, an application currently before working lands that deals with farm worker housing, which would be a, a shift. Dollars have not been able to be used for that in the past. So that's being evaluated. And there's also another project, um, and it's, it's statewide, which we're talking about, because there are uh, three or four farms in, um, in Chittenden County, and they need housing for their workers, which housing in Chittenden County is it's expensive everywhere, but it's really prohibitive for that. So there's some work being done, and so that you call it the missing middle, is what we're calling it? The missing middle, where it needs to be addressed. So there's a little, I'm happy to follow up on you, but I think we're trying to make some progress with that because people that work on these farms, you know, the farm have got to be there more than eight hours a day. So they're having to commute long distances to work on those, which is creating all, all sorts of issues. But um, happy to follow up with you on that. It's particularly challenging because a lot of the public money that we invest in housing, it's supposed to be for housing that's available to the public. And so when you provide it to one owner, it's sort of, you know, it's not publicly available. And then you have that uh, added challenge of often uh, much farmland is conserved, you know, conservation even, or you, you, you've sold your development rights. So then, therefore, you're, you're not uh, able to access the same mortgage um, sort of to be in first position to, to, to then build a home on the farm if you've got some of it enrolled in that conservation easement. So there's a lot of work on this that is playing out right now with a few test cases that Anson was talking about. Um, and I, I think there'll be even more um, opportunities down the road here, but happy to talk to you more about that. Great, we, thank you. I, I just want to respond yeah. that, that um, one of the areas that our CRP financing can be used for is to support agriculture. We have had a couple of applications that are situations similar to yours. I don't want to offer too much help. Hope, you know, one of the problems with our program is it only provides 20% of the financing that's required to do something. And um, you know, as I think I mentioned earlier, we're looking to be the last money to get a project going. So. I'm expecting our funds will be used quite in the near future. Thank you all for being here today. As I mentioned, we'll leave some of us will try to linger for a few minutes, but um, you know, again, if you need us, either reach out to Erica, reach out to one of us directly. If you look at any of our websites, you should be able to find us pretty easily. Um, Erica, do you have any last words? Sorry,